Hello, welcome back to FutureFit TV. My name is Paul, I'm Head of Personal Training at FutureFit and I'm joined by Mr. Mark Laws today. Welcome Mark to FutureFit TV Thank studio. You, Paul. Please Pleasure. do not swear. Uh, <laughs> I will do my best. <laughs> if anybody uh, doesn't know Mark, then if you head to his social media pages, you'll understand why I've asked that question, uh, or made that request rather. Uh, so Mark is a, a graduate of ours. He graduated uh, many years ago and has since gone on to uh, achieve great things within the fitness industry. Uh, in many ways, he's kind of ticked off everything on the bucket list of most fitness professionals. So lots of stuff that you, I'm sure you and certainly me would have wanted to have achieved by the time we ended our careers. Um, we're going to talk to Mark about that, what he's done, um, some of his experiences, some of his successes, maybe some of the things that he'd rather forget, uh, and also talk about how he even got into the industry in the, in the first place. So we'll get crack straight on with one of the first questions. Okay, Mark. So, yeah, welcome to the studio. What do you what do you think of our new setup here? Um, I I like it a lot. I feel very at home. If only I had a, a glass of whiskey and a cigar, I think I could uh, yeah. put my feet up and, and get quite comfortable. Yeah, that's one We might be able to stretch you a cup of tea, but yeah, okay, uh, okay, we'll, 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 we'll compromise. <laughs> so let's start off then. Well, we'll, we'll start off a bit backwards. Let's talk about what you what you've done more recently. So tell yeah. us a little bit about what you what you're kind of currently up to in the industry. Um, okay, so. So moving moving backwards chronologically, I'm I'm currently two weeks away from opening my own facility, um, which I nearly used the, the the G word and called it a gym. Uh, it's not going to be a gym in terms of pay your money, you come in and do what you want when we're open. It's going to be a very um, a session pre book sessions only. So either one to one PT, small groups. I will be running some some classes um, that will feed people into kind of my methods and principles and stuff like that. But yeah, predominantly it will just be like a, a private uh, training studio. Yeah, I think that fits with your philosophy. You're very much uh, the kind of one-to-one -one personal coaching or even small group coaching as opposed to I'd say, just let people come in and do their own thing. It's quite important to you that you teach them what to do properly. Yeah, very much. I, I've, I found, as we'll go through over the next few minutes, when I sort of explain what I've been doing over the last 10, 12, 15 years, I've spent a lot, a lot of the last five years talking to personal trainers about how to be a personal trainer. And I got to a point where I was no longer a personal trainer. I was spending all of my time telling people how to do something that I didn't actually do anymore. And it's something that I see a lot of uh, in the, 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 the upper echelons of the educators within the industry who are doing a great job of telling people how to do stuff but they don't actually do that job themselves anymore. Yeah. And I, as soon as I realized that I wasn't actually coaching people, I very quickly sucked off a lot of work that I could live without and I've made a conscious effort to always be coaching people hands-on first and foremost. Mm -hmm. So anything that I'm ever saying to people is what I'm actually doing five o'clock every Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning. I'm up and in the gym um, working with your, your neighbors, your family members, just average average people um, yeah. who, who you live around. Yeah, okay. So you're just about to open your own facility. So for many people, that would be a kind of a, a lifelong goal or ambition for, for many trainers, but you're kind of doing it later on, having already done a lot of things that you'd almost, well, a lot of trainers I think would consider to be even loftier, higher ambitions. Mm -hmm. So before we get to those, let's go back right to the start. You, you, you've qualified as a, as a trainer, you've just finished your studies, come to the end of your studies. Where did you where did you kind of get into the industry, or how did you get into the industry? I was um, I was living up in Leeds, so having graduated uh, in in that city, um, I I'd gone through my level two uh, course with Future Fit. I was waiting my my assessment date, uh, and in the meantime, I printed off a stack of CVs. I walked around Leeds, the the whole city, handing out CVs left, right, and centre, getting rejected by everybody because they didn't need any staff. Um, I then I stumbled into Virgin Active, which was the biggest and probably the best gym in the city at, at that time. Um, the, the fitness manager who met me took, took my CV, took a look at it, said, if you come back next week when you've done your assessment and we'll, we'll have a job for you. Um, so I, I did that, passed the assessment, um, went back in and the the, the guy who had offered me the job had since left the company and there was a new lady in that role who obviously knew nothing about me other than I I just qualified um, and, and it all started from there really. I was, I was in a very busy gym, there was 15 to 20 
um, level three PTs in there, plus another another probably similar number of level two gym instructors. So it's a very big, busy gym, uh, and that was my my first introduction to the the, the mainstream fitness industry. Excellent. And then very quickly, you kind of came across some really amazing opportunities that you kind of took straight away. Yeah, I, I did. I did, and those and those opportunities they they sound lucky. And when I sort of talk to people now, um, sort of going back towards the end of the story, when I'm teaching personal training, I sort of say to them that you have to you make your own luck. Like it doesn't yeah. doesn't just happen. And one thing that I say a lot is that you have to you have to learn to be in the right place at the right time. And you do that by being everywhere all of the time, um, which means you have to work your balls off. Mm. Uh, one of the things I picked up actually on our um, my nutrition and weight management module, which was the first first course I ever did with Future Fit. And the, the, the guy who was teaching it sort of said that what you need to do is kind of you need to go back home to your local newspapers and you need to tell them that you're um, a personal trainer, you're an expert in nutrition and you can give them all of these tips and things like that. And he said, you never know, somebody might publish your work. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I did that. I went and did it and, and it worked. So I went, I, my, my local newspaper about two weeks later printed uh, a story of Mark Laws, the fitness expert, uh -huh. with his top <laughs> 10 tips on, on, on a healthy lifestyle. Uh, and of course, I wasn't an expert, but the, the message there from him was that if you don't go out and do things like that, it won't come to you and ask you to, to, to do it. Mm. Um, so in the same respect with um, what happened in my career after that point, a lot of it came from the work I'd done to go above and beyond. So, for example, we um, we were based smack in the, in the for those that know Leeds, it's like right between the city centre and and um, Kirkstall, mm -hmm. which is where the Leeds Rhinos and the Leeds Tykes, as they were called, they're now called Yorkshire Carnegie, uh, where the two professional rugby teams in Leeds used to train, mm -hmm. and they used to come into our gym to use the pool for recovery. They used to come in and use the cardio kit for um, for some sort of cardio recovery sessions. Um, and I went and approached their head coach and their S&C coach and basically said, I want to do your job. Um, how, how do I go about it? Uh, and the guy sort of sat down with me, had a coffee with him in the canteen. He went and explained about the s certain elements of um, qualifications that, that would be beneficial, like weightlifting and how to handle a barbell, um, power training, plyometrics and things like that. Um, and I, I kind of went away and learned, learned a lot of those those skills um, subsequently a, a, a lad who I worked with then moved to another town called Pontefract um, to a fitness first where he was he got promoted as the health and fitness manager mm. first thing he needed to do was build up his level three PTs um, by that time I was just doing my assessment for my level three PT so he said do you want a job so great of course I do so I went I went across to 10 miles up the road and, and started working there as, as a PT same story and that Pontefract is five or six miles away from Castleford. The Castleford Tigers rugby league team used to come in and um, do their have their recovery days. They'd come in and do some S and C sessions when when it was quiet. And I had um, I had a sign up on the on the desk advertising some kettlebell classes. I just got back from America. I went to America and did a two day um, kettlebell cert with the world champion uh, Valery Fedorenko and put this board on reception saying uh, advertising classes and things like that and their SNC coach coincidentally had been told by one of his mentors that kettlebells are brilliant for um, for professional rugby players you need to you need to get someone um, to do some stuff he saw my poster and was the next thing he saw and before you know it I'm sitting down having a chat with him um, and the conversation went along the lines of he said he would um, he would do me a favor if I did him a favor. I said, okay, no problem. So he said, um, I will let you do some um, kettlebell training with my first team squad at the Castleford Tigers. Um, so I said, okay, no problem. Um, and then what he wanted in return was for me to do sessions with the academy squad as well, like they're under 17s and younger which sounded suspiciously like me doing him two favours. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but I kind of was like, okay, I'll do it. Because they were, it was, so basically he was giving me a foot in the door with the first team squad. If I went along every Tuesday, Wednesday, or Tuesday, Thursday night, 
and supervise the the academy lads. Yeah. So I, again, I, sp I spent uh, a good few months volunteering doing that. The same the same S and C coach was also yeah. working for Yorkshire Cricket. Um, so I was then going and doing sessions um, in in the nets with with the Yorkshire Cricket. So when the 14s, 15s, 16s, like likes of Joe Root coming through the coming through the ranks, um, and, and various other current internationals um, that, that as teenagers were were in there doing their doing their training, but also Michael Vaughan, who was the current England Test captain, um, which was a bit daunting for someone who had only just become a level three PT a few months ago, but having kind of been fast tracked in this environment um, to sort of learn how these guys are dealing with elite athletes it was a, a very very steep steep learning curve yeah. um, and from then on it was a very very fortunate the um, how things turned out in that, that the same SNC coach then took a job for Sheffield United um, that became available and a manager who he had worked with before at Leeds United had moved to Sheffield United took him as the S&C coach and the first thing he did is asked me if I would go in to Sheffield United and he'll do me a favour if I do him a favour, which was me doing him two favours. <laughs> um, so I was doing a few sessions with the, the first team squad um, and usually working with, say, players who um, hadn't been in the squad in a, on a match day and they just needed to do a bit of extra conditioning mm -hmm. work. Um, then I was working with a lot of the, the younger age groups. Um, Sheffield United own, owned a team at the time in... The Chinese Super League, and they had members of staff who were out there. Uh, one member of staff who was out there became ill. He had a problem with his kidney. Had to come back for an operation, and they they just asked me one Wednesday night at Bramall Lane uh, if I wanted to go to China, and so they said if if I say yes, the flight leaves Sunday. So I said yes Thursday morning, and then I went off to China for two years, where I was um, oh. well, I, so I spent the best part of two seasons. As now as a head S and C coach, where bear in mind I was less than probably eighteen months as qualified as a as a personal trainer, so I was I was making mistakes. I was learning from them. I was working under the protocol of Sheffield United Football Club, so I was picking up a a, a lot of their their um, methods and and ways of doing things, and uh, and that kind of that that really helped really helped me to develop as a as a coach. Especially working in a, a foreign country with um, people who don't understand the language and things like that, so I had to learn how to teach in Chinese, yeah. um, which was which was interesting. Um, That's one thing we don't cover on our courses yet. No, no Chinese. Yeah. No. Okay, yeah. maybe we can have a, a Mandarin module <laughs> <laughs> if you want me to leave it with very very small sentences, <laughs> short sentences. Go faster, slow down. Now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, and uh, so, and then within a month of being in China. The, um, the Chinese Football Association realised that it was now May 2008 and in August 2008 they were hosting the Beijing Olympics and they hadn't really prepared their football teams very well, football obviously being an Olympic sport. Yeah. So they looked to our club because it had strong links with the English Premier League, although Sheffield United had just that year gone down from the Premier League to the Championship, um, but they so they had ties to English football yeah. therefore they assumed that everyone associated with the club must be experts <laughs> at, at football so before you know it I was on the plane to, to Beijing and I spent six months with the, the Chinese ladies um, Olympic team um, in the, the build-up to the, the Beijing Olympics in which we were one match away from uh, winning a medal really? Olympic wow. medal yeah that's amazing um, which was, so it was great it was, it was a whirlwind sort of 12 months with, yeah. within the industry yeah, definitely. Yeah, so as I said before, the, you opening a gym, even though it's a kind of a big goal for a lot of fitness professionals, compared to other stuff that you've done in the past, that's a, it's it's almost kind of a, a quite minor compared to some of the stuff you already achieved. It, it, I kind of I've learned very quickly to take a lot of things in my stride, especially professional sport. As a as a personal trainer, the in my opinion, as a personal trainer, the goal was always to one day work with a professional sports team uh, football was my favorite sport the rugby was my playing sport so working with a, a professional football team was as good as it could get mm -hmm. and i kind of had that put on a plate for me very very quickly mm -hmm. uh, and it was it was brilliant i i loved every second of it but that industry is ruthless 
very very ruthless and it's easy come easy go and when you're out it's very difficult to get back in um so i, I did two full seasons uh, in china um at the end of one season flying back to england and a lot of the chinese uh, the the whole of the chinese football infrastructure uh, got into a lot of trouble regarding allegations of match fixing and there was a lot of players officials management um, the the, uh, the the presidents of the associations um so obviously match fixing is bad for bad pr globally <laughs> so sheffield united pulled out of the uh, or they backed off out of the deal so so then there was a handful of coaches myself included who then all of a sudden didn't have jobs to go back to we were all planning to go back for a, a, another season and, and that that wasn't there they couldn't just create five new jobs for us back at, a, in Sheffield because they didn't need that many people yeah. so all of a sudden I was I'd had everything and then I had nothing yeah it's kind of um, like the classic give it one hand and then take it yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. um so the, so i then when i moved back home uh back to, to east anglia cambridgeshire um and the nearest big town or city to me is peterborough so i decided that while i was trying to i sent a cv to every football club in the country to say that here's what i've been doing do, do you need any help i've got some great responses unfortunately we don't need anybody right now but we'll give you a call when we do um, so I thought in the meantime, I need to go back to where it all started and I need to become the best personal trainer I can be within like a, a, a geographical area. Mm. Um, Peterborough being a, a not, albeit not a huge city, but the, the closest thing to a, a big city near where I lived. So I went and set up there, uh, back to fitness first. Um, I had a great CV, I had a lot of experience and I, I then developed a very good personal training business um doing 40 45 sessions a week um over about 100 hours a week <laughs> um sort of working every hour god sent yeah. to uh um to, to to perfect my skill as a as a pt with the general public as opposed to with with an athlete yeah, yeah which is just a different approach obviously it, it, yes and no it, i mean i kind of what i think what made it so successful for me is that i I sort of treated them, I trained them in the same way that I would train an athlete okay. in terms of this is what you want to get better at and this is where you are at the minute and this is how we're going to get there mm. rather than just a generic here's the same program for all 20 clients mm. and then scratch my head at the end of the day when 19 of them didn't get anywhere and one of them through luck yeah. rather than through judgment, achieved something. Um, I, I'd kind of learned to adapt the, the the generic session and modify it to each individual person based on their their current position, what they wanted, and the obstacles that, that were in the way. Okay. Um, so so it actually kind of I, I, I feel it benefited me and yeah. just stood me in good stead. Yeah, I can definitely see how you know, the skills and the one of the experiences can kind of aid or transfer across and help yeah. you. Was there a difference in the, the motivation levels between the athletes and the general public, do you think? Um, yes, but not how you would imagine okay. it. Um, there, was, there was a difference in the motivation was that it was a hell of a lot easier to get the general public to That's do things that you got asked <laughs> of them rather than you try taking a, a professional footballer who's worth... Ten million pounds and get ten thousand pounds a week, and then asking him to do something he doesn't want to do. Yeah, true. Uh, it's it, it's it's not easy. Yeah. Um, and I I've, I've since been back into Premier League football clubs and delivered S and C workshops to their S and C team, and they've admitted to me that their policy for the gym is. The gym's on the left. If you want to call in and see us before you go home, we'll be right. in there. Uh, the players stream past, yeah. go home and play on their Xboxes. Yeah. There might be a couple of the older guys who know they need to look after themselves. We'll yeah. go and do a little bit of foam rolling. Um, but there's there's a lot of the. I'm going back sort of eight years ago here. It's, it's improving and it's it's changing massively. But okay. um, but yeah, it's it's hard work to get to get footballers, especially to. To, to buy into a lot of SNC right. stuff. Yeah. We better stop that conversation there before we say anything libelous, I'd imagine. <laughs> I, won't, I won't name <laughs> names. <laughs> uh, so you obviously achieved some, some great things in terms of the kind of the coaching clients or uh, customers or even athletes, but what about the other side of the industry? So you've got into teaching other fitness professionals as well. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, so that came, my break there was with a company called Jordan Fitness, who are predominantly an equipment manufacturer, but they, they have an educational uh, sort of arm to their, their business as well. Um, and again, slightly fortuitously, they, they're based very close to my, to my home, it, literally four or five miles from where I, where I grew up in my parents' in my parents' house. Um, and they were just going through a transition within their, their, their director of education was leaving, which was going to leave a, a gap. And with it being a small town, somebody who I knew knew somebody who knew the owner and just put my name up as somebody who had worked at the Olympics, worked with all these professional sports teams, so therefore they must be ridiculously experienced, albeit I wasn't as experienced yeah. as, as, as I probably could have been. Um, and I, I rocked up, I spoke to them, um, sort of, I then started basing, I never taught a walk, workshop before, but I knew how to teach somebody how to swing a kettlebell. I knew how to teach someone how to teach someone how to swing a kettlebell. So I ended up teaching these workshops um, based on their equipment, but kind of using everything that I've learned from working with athletes, working with clients, and also teaching things to other coaches who were then going to be teaching it to other players. Um, and it kind of all tied together quite nicely. And I, I feel like it gave me a very well-rounded um, ability to, to teach a course to a personal trainer, um, because not only does it show that I've, I've worked at a higher level, but I also worked with the, the most average of clients, yeah. um, and I kind of can adapt I feel like I can adapt that skill to anywhere on that spectrum, yeah. which 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 is beneficial for for a PT. Yeah, definitely. And it's definitely worked. You've since gone on to deliver workshops and seminars internationally. You worked yeah. in Dubai, the Philippines. Yeah. Where else? Do you... <laughs> uh, Dubai, all over all over Europe. Yeah. Uh, I've been over to the, the States uh, a couple of times, uh, Asia a, a, a handful of times, the Middle East. Um, yeah, all, all around the world, and yeah. and that has, from the outside looking in, it's lucky. From the inside looking out, that has come from being everywhere all of the time. The amount of things I've done for free, or I've gone above and beyond, or I've done people favors, and they've then got transferred. They've got this new fancy role as head of education for Fitness First in the Middle East, and. Who do they come to when they when they want someone to speak at their event or, or, or things like that? It's, mm -hmm. So all of that has come from the the invisible hard work that um, that that nobody sees that that has paid off um, further down the line. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's no one sees kind of that background work. It's the you know, the, the classic. It took ten years to become an overnight success. Right, hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so with some really interesting insights there from, uh, from Mark in terms of his career so far. In the next video, we're going to talk about Mark's educational journey in terms of his starting his studies with Future Fit and how he found that experience.